congratulations. It's such an honor to be speaking to you today. When I received the invitation, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I have so many trips ahead of me. But of course, I had to say yes. And I was thrilled. And I do want to congratulate you because you've achieved so much in a relatively short period of time. I'm the faculty advisor to the UMass Amherst Inform Student Chapter. And in September, we'll be celebrating our 15th anniversary. Wow. So for you to get a Magna Cum Laude Award so quickly, it really, really means something. I served on that committee, so kudos to all of you. It's definitely worth it, and it's also worth it on the job market to do what you do. Believe me, all my students tell me that. So greetings from our student chapter. These are some of our offer, uh, officers. They send their regards to you. They're very fast. The weather in Amherst is very similar to here, so I feel right at home. Now, uh, I'd like to tell you something. This is very nostalgic for me, because actually the first conference I had ever been to as a doctoral student took place in Montreal. Okay? And I went with my uh, dissertation advisor, Dr. Stella DeFermos, and amazingly, I'm staying in the very same hotel, <laughs> the Royal Terrace Hotel. Although when we were there, I heard it was something else, maybe a house of ill repute. I don't know, but anyway, okay, that's what I have heard. So today I'm going to give you a very panoramic kind of view of the kind of research that we're, uh, we've been conducting for the past 10, 15 years. What I'd like to do is essentially show you the excitement about the work, how much the world needs operations researchers and the great students and faculty like you have here. Okay. I also very much appreciate that it was emphasized the multidisciplinary work, right, which is something that we really, really believe in. So some of the applications that I'll be highlighting range from food to pharma, and uh, also I'll be talking about some energy networks, transportation, logistics, many, many applications. That's the thing, when you start working in an area, and if you're really involved, you read the paper, you talk with practitioners, there's just, I don't know if it's good, it's good for us, but there's one problem after another. We never, ever run out of fascinating problems to work on. That's why we're so lucky we're in this great field. So, some background. Okay, I wanted to tell you this was my doctoral dissertation advisor, Stella DeFermos. She was actually only the second female in the world to have received a PhD in operations research, which she did in 1968. She's also the only female to be honored uh, by our you know, flagship uh, publication, Operations Research, with an obituary. Sadly, she passed away at the age of 49 and left two children, okay, which is really, really sad. But I travel with her around the world, many influence conferences. I actually shared a room with her. So that was really, really fun. How many of you have shared a room with your dissertation advisor? <laughs> there was lots of adventures. And also, she was the only female professor in both the Division of Applied Mathematics and the Division of Engineering so they counted her twice, okay? Looks good for equal opportunity. Now, something else I like to mention, and this I think is so cool, okay? There's something you might be familiar with known as the mathematical genealogy, okay? I don't know if your advisors are on it, but as soon as you get your PhD, do bug your advisors to put your name on it, okay, and so forth. So uh, one of my students, actually my 18th PhD student, presented me with this huge mathematical genealogy. So what does that mean? Okay, you know who your dissertation advisor right, is. Do you know who your dissertation, dissertation advisor was? And so forth and so on. Okay? So this is my lineage, which I think, like, wow, okay. we're real great scientists. Okay, so my immediate uh, PhD advisor was Stella DeFermos. Okay, her advisor was Tom Sparrow at Johns Hopkins, and you go back and you look, there's Maxwell, everyone here knows Maxwell's equations, okay? Have you heard of Newton? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. And Galileo, okay? So I tell my students, you have no pressure. You're just standing on the shoulders of giants, okay? But clearly there's some pressure. But it's fantastic, I think, to see so many physicists and really renowned scientists in the academic pedigree. Italians, British, and so on. It's, it's really, really exciting. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, 
Also, I see the very active faculty here, and congratulations to them. It's very important that we mentor our PhD students. Uh, just last week, I graduated my 21st PhD student, which I think is pretty good, and I've had 11 females and 10 males. Okay? So it's kind of very, very balanced. And her parents came from uh, India to celebrate. And in fact, we have this fantastic photo on Twitter, which you might have seen. They made us all a chump, okay? which was uh, a very, very joyous occasion. Okay, so I'm fascinated by networks. Okay, just about every problem I work on, there's some sort of network behind it. It might not be obvious, but there's definitely a network. So if I'm giving a presentation, I have to tell you about the Bryce Paradox. Everyone here knows about it? Yes, no, no, okay, I'll mention it, okay. So when it comes to network systems, you're familiar with congested urban transportation networks. It took us a long time to come from the airport, even though it was a commuting time. I know quite a few of you work on supply chains and so on, also social networks. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started working on financial networks, and I must say financial networks are actually much simpler than congested urban transportation networks, so we've even contributed to that area. Uh, moreover, we've done a lot of work in energy networks, and I'll just show you one like very, very basic model, and also on the internet, where we have several major projects working with computer scientists and electrical computer engineers to re-envision a different kind of internet, which I find really, really exciting. And it's been actually very well funded by the National Science Foundation. So the famous Bryce Paradox, and the reason I'm presenting it is whenever we deal with network systems, you have to be aware about the behavior of users on networks. If you're not aware of that, okay, you can make very, very bad decisions. And that's extremely important with the US. You know, we're hoping to invest in infrastructure and so forth. So Bryce, in a very, very famous paper, published in German, but I can see Deutsch, anyone here? No, okay, and that's why we translated the article, because not everyone, but I can see Deutsch. Okay, you have a single origin node one, you have a single destination node four, and travelers, they're selfish, they want to determine the best route of travel to get to work. We're dealing with a congested world, so the travel cost on a link will depend upon the flow on the link. Okay? And the travelers keep on switching their paths until they can't do any better. So you have what are known as user-optimized conditions holding, in which case for each origin destination pair, all used paths, that is those with positive flow, will have equal and minimal travel costs. So no one has any incentive to switch. Okay? So if you look at this very simple network topology, and you look at the user link cost functions, you'll see that the user cost on link A is the same as the user cost on link D, and the same for the user cost on link B versus the user cost on link C. So if we have, say, you know, whatever flow, say, demand per unit time going from origin node one to origin node four, travelers will equally distribute themselves. And in this case, you'll have three travelers per unit time using path P1 consisting of links A, C, three uh, travelers using path P2, consisting of links B and D, everyone arrives safely, which is good, we have no perishability here, luckily, and the equilibrium path cost will be 83, so you think of 83 minutes. Okay, now let's say you're a network designer and you decide to add a link E. You would think, ah, we have more choices. Now we have three ways of getting from, you know, home to our university, okay, destination number four. So path P3 will consist of links A, E, and D. So travelers find out that there's another path. They okay, readjust their flows and so forth. And you get a new user-optimized traffic flow pro uh, pattern taking place equal to the following. You'll have two vehicles per unit time on each of the paths, right? Two plus two plus two is equal to the demand six. But look what happens to the travel cost or travel time. Rather than it taking 83 minutes to get to work, it now takes 92 minutes. So everyone in the network is worse off. Okay, that's not good. Okay, this will never happen if you have a single objective function and you're minimizing total cost to the society. In other words, if you have system optimization. But it happens in these decentralized networks, user-optimized networks. Now, you might think, 
Poe's Prize, okay, he can't be alive. He's actually alive and well, he's 80 years old, and because of the fascination with this paradox in other kinds of network systems, including the internet, especially by computer scientists, there was great demand to translate this article from German to English. It's kind of interesting as scholars, you never know what kind of skills are useful. Okay, know your languages, know your chemistry, know your physics, okay, everything is useful. So we actually translated the article from German to English. It was published in the Informed Journal of Transportation Science. At that time, I had a wonderful doctoral student who was from Austria, who's native speaker of German, Tina Wachelbinger. And we were the first ones in North America, this was in 2006, to invite Professor Dietrich Bryce to come and give a talk on the paradox. No one had ever done that, okay? And that was part of the UMass Amherst informed student chapters, so you see? You know, students like move the world. And now Tina has gotten full professorship four years after her PhD. Do you know anyone who has gotten a full professorship faster? Probably not. She has her own institute at the Vienna University of Economics and Business and was one of our keynote speakers at the 50th anniversary of the Eisenberg School PhD program on uh, April 5th, okay, which is pretty cool. And also in uh, the this, this issue of transportation science, we wrote a preface saying how Professor Dietrich Bryce actually came up with the idea of the paradox. Not only was it in the paradox, but he also rediscovered classical wardrobe principles of travel behavior known as user optimization and system optimization, which was quite something. And he came and visited us, stayed about five days, okay, we took him to a lot of beer halls, and he sent his regards, okay, and communicated with him recently, so very, very exciting. And also this Bryce paradox around the world. There have been many instances where they actually have removed roads from like downtown locations and travel time has improved, okay? Probably the most famous example is in Seoul, Korea, where they destroyed the original highway. It was like a six lane highway, resurrected the original river, okay? Air quality improved and travel time improved. For those who are working on that have PhDs in civil engineering and were very, very familiar with the Bryce paradox, okay? I was involved with uh, actually New York City, okay, where you had the then mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, actually removing, uh, converting a major area okay, in central Manhattan on Broadway from 42nd to 47th Street and converting it to a pedestrian plaza. At first, people complained because they didn't like the plastic chair, they didn't think it was elegant, but even a lot of the taxi drivers said the travel time actually improved. And with the new mayor, he wanted to stop that, and the people rebelled, said, we want to keep okay, it as a pedestrian plaza. So you see, your research can take you to Broadway. And in fact, I was there on March 15th, freezing, 20 degrees, cold, rainy, uh, to be filmed for a production of uh, a PBS, Public Broadcasting System production, America Revealed, on transportation. And these various uh, kind of network systems are featured. They're wonderful to use for students in classes and so on, on energy, on food, and in transportation. And the one who interviewed me, I don't know if you're aware of the program Survivor, he was a winner, okay, $1.5 million. But he has a degree from Stanford. He has taken game theory courses, so he's pretty familiar with like game theory and so forth. And Bryce Paradox even happens in not only the internet, but it also happens in terms of baseball and so forth. So it's very, very, very interesting. But never in system optimized networks. And a lot of times you think, okay, there's just a single objective function and constraints you can control. Yes, but in the real world, there are typically many interacting decision makers. Okay, so what happens? You know, what are the equilibrium patterns? And so forth? That's what we're really interested in. Another thing that I find fascinating is Bryce nailed this problem, okay? When the demand is six, you have the Bryce paradox occur. When you have a demand that's much lower, you only have the new path being used and the Bryce paradox doesn't occur. 
And if the demand is eight and eight nines or higher, then you almost have like a wisdom of crowds phenomenon happening. And the original two paths are used, the new one is not used, and it doesn't occur. Okay, so that I think is pretty cool. So we did like an evolutionary variable inequality proof of that with my collaborator Patrizia Daniel at the University of Catania and also a very good friend of mine, Professor David Har Harkis, who's a professor of computer science at Harvard, when I was a science fellow actually at Harvard. Okay, so the Bryce paradox only occurs in that network of that topology and cost functions for a certain range of demand. Okay, so I say there's a lot of interesting stuff So, but the thing is, there are other network systems that are decentralized and behave like congested urban transportation networks. The internet and also electric power generation distribution networks. So you really have to watch out for these paradoxical phenomena. Now, supply chains, I view them as networks, okay? And if you look at the different applications, I mean, the world is truly your oyster. Whether you're interested in profit maximizing, you know, the commercial supply chains, whether you're interested in disaster relief, okay, if you care about you know, social responsibility and so forth, numerous, numerous applications, okay? And all you have to do is pick up the news. Now we're working on tariffs and quotas. Everyone knows what's happening? Sorry, folks. I was born in Canada, so don't blame me. I think I want my Canadian passport back. Okay, so many of these uh, images that I'm showing you here, we've actually worked on. Okay, compared to product food supply chains, uh, to time-sensitive delivery of products in disaster relief, and even fast fashion. Who would have thought that fast fashion is a perishable product? Well, it is time-sensitive. Okay. It's actually really interesting. So if we look at supply chains today, you'll see they have a lot of uh, characteristics, I would argue, similar to congested urban transportation networks, large-scale nature, okay, think about the demand for smartphones, you know, hundreds of thousands of locations around the world. We're dealing a lot with congestion, non-linearities, okay, uh, alternative behavior of users of networks, I just mentioned the Bryce Paradox, sometimes you have very conflicting criteria associated with optimization. You might want to minimize time, but that might maximize emissions and so on. So you see why our tools are so, so important. Also, uh, we do a lot of work on super networks, so you have kind of the relationships between and among different kinds of network systems. What happens when the internet goes down? How does that affect financial networks, electric power networks, and so on? Okay. In addition, I'd like to emphasize, you know, when we uh, work on critical infrastructure and so forth, how you decide where to put something, you know, a bridge, a road, uh, where to invest has implications politically, socially, and economically, so you have to factor that in. And we've also done a lot of work identifying, you know, which is the most important node in the supply chain, which is the most important node in the transportation network, which are the most important links, you know, how would you rank them and so forth. Okay, we developed measures uh, with a former student of mine, actually Patrick Chung. Now, the methodology that we utilize uh, to model both non-cooperative supply chain networks and also a variety of cooperative ones is that of the theory of irrational inequalities. And actually, it was my dissertation advisor at Brown that recognized that the traffic network equilibrium conditions as stated by Professor Mike Smith of England had the structure of a variational inequality problem. Okay, so that just, revolutionized tons of different applications and has had a great impact on different kinds of disciplines. And I think that's something that we do so brilliantly, okay? We'll have problems that we're totally obsessed with. Don't you have that? You're all obsessed with your PhDs and so forth. And it's really, really hard to solve, but you'll be thinking about it night, daytime, so forth. And ultimately, you might have to develop entirely new methodology, because maybe there's no methodology out there to solve your problems. But believe me, if you work at it hard enough, you will do it, okay? And that's really, really important. So the variational inequality problem is a single inequality, okay? We have a feasible set K. We have a vector of uh, variables, say X, and you want to figure out the X star. Okay, such that you have the inner product is greater than or equal to zero. Now, 
What is really nice about this, the function that enters the Verge inequality, f of x star, it captures a lot of the behavior. So in congested urban transportation networks, it would be, for example, the vector of all of the different path costs. Okay, when it comes to uh, different kinds of game theory problems where you have profit maximization, it would be like minus the utility and so forth. So it's a really nice unifying framework. Okay? And also it's related to many of the classical problems of mathematical programming. So that's why I feel it's a natural methodology for a spectrum of supply chain problems. Okay? Particularly decentralized ones, but even for centralized ones. Now, I had, when I was teaching my transportation logistics course, students would say, hey, we don't just care about the equilibrium. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, equilibrium state. What happens before you reach the equilibrium? Okay, what kind of interactions may be taking place with the decision makers and so forth? So, uh, um, actually, uh, a while ago, along with a collaborator of mine, <coughs> Andrew Pui, of uh, the Division of Applied Mathematics at Brown University, we developed a new kind of uh, dynamical system, which is called a projected dynamical system. Okay? In operations research, we're always dealing with constraints, right? Amazingly, in dynamical systems, essentially what they were doing, x dot equals minus f of x, right? You have some initial state, x zero equals x zero. Okay? No constraints, nothing. So I go, uh-oh. And we really want to do something where you have constraints. So we developed this whole new theory, wrote a couple of papers. I wrote a book with uh, my former doctoral student, Ding Sheng, where we have the natural underlying dynamics associated with variational inequality problems. So you can identify all sorts of different Tantra Mott processes. Okay, you start with a certain x0, and you will see how the system evolves over time until you have a steady state reached, okay? So this is really, really useful, not only in operations research, transportation, management science, but also in economics, okay? The economists now, led by Bill Sandholm at the University of Wisconsin, are using our projected dynamical systems to solve problems they could never solve before, okay? In evolutionary games, population games, and so forth. Uh, we're doing a lot of work also in predator-prey networks. These are like nature supply chains, which is fascinating. You have anchovies being eaten by bigger fish and so forth and so on. So I work with ecologists in France that came to me, okay, and so on. And even in neuroscience and other kinds of applications like wireless networks, cognitive radio spectrum, and so forth. So again, we have applications that you really want to solve uh, you want to formulate, and methodology doesn't exist, so we have to go and discover the methodologies. And if you work at it hard enough, and sometimes you pick up collaborators, you can merge different areas and get the job done, and it's very, very satisfying. So just about every book I've ever written has like network in the title. Uh, one of my colleagues at Imperial College in London says, Anna, every time I get one of your books, my students always steal your books. And say that's fine, that's actually good. But when it came to the Fragile Networks book, ironically, as soon as it was published by John Wiley and Sons, which is an excellent technical publisher, it got stolen completely and replicated on websites around the world. I didn't mind so much, my collaborator, like, he wanted the royalties and so forth. So we talked to the publisher. And like cease and desist in Russia, in Ukraine, you can still get copies, I'm pretty sure, online. I don't want to look, but that's the way it is. But that generated interest in cybersecurity. I never thought I'd be working in cybersecurity. Now we've done a lot of work in that area as well. So supply chains. Okay, here I'm arguing for a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, to handle a lot of the really interesting problems I feel in perishable product supply chains. You have to kind of go back to some of the physics, some of the chemistry, and so forth, and not just math and optimization. So just to give you some examples of perishable product supply chains in healthcare, I'm gonna show you something about blood supply chains, which is a fascinating application, because that's something you cannot produce. Okay? People have to be willing to donate, okay? We have medical nuclear supply chains, so you need physics formula to figure out 
was happening to those medical nucleotides. And they essentially had a half-life of 66 hours. So it's based on physics, they really perish, okay? You know, they just disappear. Okay, so, and you have a very short time window in which to actually be delivering a lot of these supplies to people, uh, to patients and so on. Obviously, we have a lot of pharmaceuticals that require cold chains, and also food, okay? And uh, here, in terms of food, we also do a lot of work in modeling food quality. So we work with food scientists, okay, which we find very, very gratifying. So first, I'll show you some optimization problems in terms of perishable products, and then I'll talk about some game theory problems, and I'll do a deeper dive into a pharmaceutical model, which we developed. Yeah. Uh, this was work that was done with two former doctoral students of mine, Amir Masumi and Renu, that are both professors now, and it was published in Computational Management Science. It was really the first kind of general supply chain network model associated with blood supply chains. We weren't just interested in inventory management, we're interested in the entire, all the different tiers. And it was, was work that was actually uh, stimulated by many, many discussions that we had with American Red Cross. And what's fascinating in the US is that the blood supply chain industry is being completely transformed. American Red Cross only has about 40% now of the blood that it gives to hospitals and trauma centers. Uh, there's competition in this industry, which you never, ever would have thought of. Okay, I write a lot of op-ed pieces for newspapers. I get contacted internationally, even from the UK. Like, why doesn't the US do things like we do with our blood services when we don't have socialized medicine? US and so on. And there are even startups now trying to make the blood deliveries kind of more efficient. A lot of donors, when they give blood, they want the blood to be used within their own regions. They don't want it to be used, you know, thousands of miles away and so forth. Okay? Also, blood is a highly perishable product. When we're dealing with platelets, it's only five days, okay? even under a cold chain. Red blood cells, it's 42 days. And now there's a lot of discussion whether even like younger blood is uh, of higher quality, and also blood of the PhD students is better than my blood. Okay, so it's like we want your blood. There are many donations that are needed. Uh, many times of the year there are a lot of shortages because you can't donate blood when you have like flu, the cold, and so forth. And during vacation times, students don't donate blood. So American Red Cross is faced with a lot of challenges. At the same time. There have been all sorts of innovations in terms of uh, surgical procedures that many surgical procedures don't require as much blood as before, which is really, really interesting. Okay. So this is quite complicated. You see many different tiers. You have the blood collection, the shipment, the testing, and sometimes that's being outsourced, the storage, shipment, and ultimate delivery uh, to points of demand where also you have inventory. And associated with each of these links, you're gonna have perishability, okay? Because not all the blood that is tested is retained, okay? Usually it's only like 98% or so forth. So we have associated with these links uh, different arc multipliers uh, that track, okay, how much blood you actually have left when it goes on a particular path from origin node to a different destination. And in uh, the blood supply chain models that we've done for the Red Cross, we handle waste, we handle perishability, we handle also uncertainty, because sometimes you have trauma and so forth, so the demand can be uncertain, okay? unlike for scheduled, okay, different kinds of surgery. So it's really, really interesting work. So that's kind of one application, just very high level. Also medical nuclear supply chains. And there's a connection to Canada. Are you familiar with the Chalk River Medical Nuclear Facility in Ottawa, Canada? It was 40 or 50 years old. In 2016, it was mothballed, and they brought it up again. Uh, last month, it was a completely shut down. It provided most of the medical and nuclear uh, ties for the US. Okay, so now we have a real problem in the United States, and the government is getting involved, and the Department of Energy, because uh, these medical nucleotides are used for cardiac diagnostics and also for cancer diagnostics. Tens of thousands of these are done, well, 
in the U.S. if there aren't shortages and so forth. Okay, so it's very, very interesting. You have to know the underlying physics associated with how molybdenum is transformed into technetium. This also involves hazardous uh, transportation. And amazingly, we were the first ones to do a uh, medical nuclear supply chain model a few years ago. And we were even contacted by the OECD in Paris and said, how could you have done this? You know, we've been working on this. I said, well, we have students and we want to figure this out because this, this is a real problem. And so it's a fascinating application uh, of physics and operations research. And now the NRU Canada no longer exists. So you only have a few places where you can actually irradiate these. And a lot of airlines, they don't want to be shipping hazmat material to the US or around the world. Okay. So the Department of Energy, and this is just happening in the past couple of months, is uh, starting to give out grants to universities and companies in the US to see if they can do these uh, irradiations of molybdenum to technetium. Okay, but you have to worry because it's highly enriched uranium. They worry about nuclear thefts and so forth, terrorists, and so uh, lots of associated issues. And uh, you really should look this up because it's fascinating. Okay. So you see you have radioisotope production, transportation, and we have one of the facilities that does the generator manufacturing actually in Eastern Massachusetts. More transportation and ultimately elucidation at different hospitals okay, where they do the nuclear imaging. And at each of these you have decay. Okay? And you know how long it takes to transport, so you'll know how much of this nuclear time you'd actually have left after a transportation on a particular line because of the physics and the radioactive decay. So, fascinating, okay? No one can challenge you on this. This is physics, okay? That's how much will be left depending upon the time and so forth. Okay, so, so and these are like system optimization models that we've developed because we were interested also in cost recovery for these medical nuclear supply chains. What about game theory? Okay, one of my idols is, besides you know, Stella DeFermos and others in our field, uh, John Nash, okay. and tragically he died in a car accident. I don't think he was wearing a seatbelt, okay. and neither was his wife in New Jersey after he had received uh, the Abel Prize in Norway a few years ago. So that was really, really sad. Okay, so to show you just some highlights from some empirical work, okay, uh, we have the hottest month on record in uh, New England in July 2006. So we were really, really interested in developing an electric power generation distribution model. Very close to our university, we have the independent system operator, uh, ISO New England. Uh, I've organized multiple tours for our students uh, to go there. It's like a super high-tech facility. It's out of this world. They're ready with their buses and their computers in case something goes wrong. Uh, they're responsible for uh, the reliability of the electric power network for all of New England. And actually, they're really, really good. Okay. Uh, actually, some really good friends there. Okay, so this is a model we developed. You can see many, many uh, states and regions. And we were interested in the engineering and in the economics. Okay. There's a lot of issues with congestion in Connecticut, for example. And you have to do the pricing right and so forth. So we had different kinds of fuel markets. Uh, we had the transmission lines. And amazingly, ISO New England had a lot of the data online, which I'm not sure we should have, and so on. Even the prices uh, for that particular month for every hour. And sometimes the wholesale prices even go negative. It's really fun to play around with this like in the summer and so on. So the empirical model had 20,000 variables. We model the behavior of all the decision makers. Okay, so it was this very large scale game theory problem, which we ended up actually transforming into a congested transportation network reporting problem, and solving it like that. And our hourly prices for that particular month were very close to what was actually uh, seen in reality. So we were very, and of course, we have a good model. You can do all sorts of sensitivity analysis look at different fuel compositions, what that does to the price and so on. Okay, so we all need energy, right? Electric power energy, if something fails, then it's bad. Food, are you hungry for lunch? Not yet, I hope. 
that Buddhists haven't been anyone can relate to. And it's so great to be in Montreal with all the pastry shops and so on. So I really appreciate it. But food is perishable. We do a lot of work on fresh produce supply chains, even farmers markets and so forth, dairy and so on. And actually, a lot of the agricultural problems that we're uh, modeling also now are being in, uh, subject to all sorts of tariffs and tariffs break quotas and quotas, so it makes it really, really interesting. And we found in our latest research that actually tariffs and quotas hurt consumers of the countries, okay, in which these tariffs and quotas are imposed. Moreover, the quality of the food goes down that's imported, okay, consumer welfare goes down. So come on, government officials, you know, listen, you're hurt, hurting your own people. Okay. So the thing is, when it comes to fresh grown-up produce, there is a lot of perishability okay, in terms of the transportation process, and a lot even from the consumer side. Okay. Do you eat everything that you purchase? So this is another fascinating uh, perishable product supply chain. And you can see different, uh, actually, countries around the world, okay, different continents and so on, uh, where it, you have the losses. Is it the consumer or is it the you know, other part of the supply chain and so forth? In North America, we tend to waste a lot on the consumer side and also um, in the production and the transportation. When it comes to Africa, Africa has all sorts of challenges because the infrastructure is so bad. They don't waste the food as much, but the supply chain itself is not very good. Okay, so this model we developed and it was published in the European Journal of Operational Research and at the Euro Conference in Poznan, it was recognized as one of the two papers uh, by the editors published in the previous three years that has had a high impact, okay, a high citation. So we were really honored uh, about that. So here we have competition now. The food firms are competing with each other. The consumers at the various you know, demand points, the retail outlets, uh, distinguish the food firms based on brand. Okay? And that has to do essentially with quality dimensions. And associated with each of the production links, transportation links, processing links, you also have arc multipliers, okay? because you have waste as it transits and so on. So this is a game theory problem. Okay, each firm wants to determine the optimal path flows associated with the flows of the fresh produce so that it maximizes profits but also cares about minimizing waste. Okay, so essentially it's a multi-criteria decision-making uh, game theory problem. Okay? And uh, you can also figure out you know, different quality parameters, different waste parameters associated with the links. It's fascinating that different fresh produce, according to food scientists, have usually different rates of decay. You have like first order, second order, and you have the logistics equation and so forth that bananas follow and so on. And when it comes to bananas, you gotta watch it because a lot of crates of bananas coming from Africa that just end up in the ocean. Okay? So that we don't model. That's still interesting. So what about pharma? Okay, yesterday I flew from Bradley Airport, Springfield, in Hartford, to Toronto, where I picked up a load of mail, to Montreal. Not the most efficient, but still, I don't mind. And when I picked up the globe and mail, on the front page was an article on pharmaceuticals. And uh, uh, some people, some were students actually, that are suffering because they're not getting their medicines covered by the Canadian government, which kind of shocked me because I thought things were much better here than they are in the US. Okay. But this is an industry that uh, needs a lot of work and it needs a lot of help. It's also a huge industry. You look at it, trillion dollars, okay, over a trillion dollars. Okay, so here, I'm gonna show you because I'm running a little bit out of time. Uh, in terms of product perishability, there a lot of these pharmaceuticals, they have expiration dates, so you really shouldn't be selling them after expiration date, although many uh, like companies in the U.S. were actually doing that, and they got caught, including even like baby formula and so forth, which is not good. Uh, so that's a problem. And the other hand, we also have numerous uh, pharmaceutical product shortages in the U.S., that to me is unconscionable. That is absolutely horrible. That people cannot get their medicines you know, 
the medicines that can cure even leukemia and so on are against the flu. And in fact, there's even the Cleveland Clinic, one of the best uh, hospitals in the US, has started manufacturing its drugs. Because they had to ration drugs for its patients. A lot of people in America are getting bigger and bigger. And they were giving them only about a third of the dosage because they didn't have enough. That doesn't bother you. I mean, it bothers me tremendously in our country. And there are all sorts of issues associated with these shortages. Sometimes there are quality failures. Sometimes it's only a single supplier of a generic pharmaceutical and so on. Sometimes it's pricing and so on. So the FDA is just very slowly starting to get into this. And also, I don't know if you know, but most of the ingredients okay, in pharmaceuticals in the US are actually come from the developing world, from India and China. Okay, and a lot of times the quality issues example that was just in Sunday's New York Times and a lot of times the inspectors that go there uh, they're not allowed in or you know, there's falsification and so on so to me that is also horrible uh, you don't know about the quality of your generic drug sometimes okay if it does nothing that's fine but how do you model if it actually hurts you okay like it's happened I mean is that negative quality I, I don't know if you know let me know we'll write a great paper Okay, so, and also we have tons of financial pressures in this field. So we developed a pharmaceutical model, okay, focusing on, at that time, the best selling drug in the US, Lipitor, which was produced by Pfizer. It was giving Pfizer billions of dollars, okay, a year. But in 2011, it was losing patent right protection. I don't know if you know about pharmaceutical companies, but they sometimes switch the patent. You know, even the way of injecting is a little bit different, so they can keep the patent and so forth. And lip, and believe me, Pfizer was extremely, extremely worried. So we were interested. Okay, what can we do about this? You know, can we get some data and model it and so forth? Well, we did. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. And we have perishability here. Okay, we have costs associated with medical waste. And here you have to track uh, along a particular path, you know, how much is actually left of the product because you have perishability. Okay, so we have arc multipliers on links and also arc multipliers on paths and conservation of flow equations. And this was a problem where they're maximizing profits. So rho I K would be the price charged by firm I, pharmaceutical firm I, at demand point K. And it's a function of different demands for the different pharmaceutical products, it's different demand. Like we have costs associated with all the different links, okay, production, transportation, uh, storage, and so on. So what's the utility function? Utility function of a pharmaceutical firm I is uh, the following. You have the revenue, the prices, times how much you actually get, okay, delivered to the various demand points, minus all the various link total costs, minus the various waste costs. So each is maximizing, okay, and competing with one another. So this is a Nash equilibrium, or a supply chain network equilibrium. Each is trying to figure out its strategies of path flows so it can't improve upon its profits, given the strategies of its competitors, okay, subject to various constraints. So here in uh, actually classical variation equality theory, you can, under certain conditions, convert Nash equilibrium problems into variation equality problems. And so that's what it looks like, where essentially you have the gradient uh, with respect to the strategic variables of each of the pharmaceutical firms, okay, equal here, and inner product with the strategic variables, and you're interested in determining that equilibrium vector x star. Okay, so we have different formulations. You can do path flows uh, or in terms of link flows, and we have the standard form. Okay. Now it's kind of cool to see Wait a minute, is this model related to others? It's actually related to fast fashion, who would think, okay? But there you don't have perishability, but you still have profit maximization. I never thought I'd work on fast fashion. I didn't do it, it didn't come from my heart. It came from researchers in Hong Kong saying, could you help us, we're interested in, and we think your work is relevant, okay? And they were also interested in emissions, okay? Another one that we did was mergers and acquisitions. If the product is homogeneous, 
you have many different firms competing. Okay, you can have beer companies, different kinds. What is the gain associated with mergers? And there's actually a merger paradox in economics, which I found out, which I thought was fascinating. So we think we clarified that up there was saying, essentially, uh, why is it only two firms are merging and so forth, where sometimes you might have more firms merging and so on. So we care about algorithms. Okay, I have friends at MIT say, Anna, you code? And then once we become full professors, we never code again. I love to code. And I think it's really, really satisfying and so on. So uh, based on the theory of projective dynamic systems, we also have a whole new portfolio of algorithms for solving various equality problems and also tracking the trajectory, so we're interested in that. So we apply an Euler method, and you get closed form solutions in terms of the pathways, which is really nice, very easy to implement. So some case studies just to show you. Okay, it's gonna be Pfizer versus Merck. They're gonna be competing, okay? And Pfizer is losing patent right protection. This is, okay, so what's gonna happen? Each has several manufacturing sites, distribution sites. These were different parts uh, of the US as demand points. We parameterize uh, the demand price functions, and essentially the price for a month that a patient would have. And we get flows, and these are you know, in hundreds of thousands, okay? And we get the demands. And Pfizer would dominate, you see the 10.32, typically what makes sense, okay? And um, the second one, Merck dominated the second demand point, 8.46. And then we decided, you can see the utility functions, the profit, and so on. Now, what happens if Lipitor loses it? Okay. And there's a story behind this. When we submitted this paper to a journal, the reviewers came back and said, this can't happen. Okay, we waited a few weeks, and it exactly we showed that, okay, Pfizer lost like 40% of its profits and its brand dominance, okay? So believe in yourself. You know, the Nobel laureate in economics, George Akerlof, he had his prize, Nobel Prize winning paper rejected three times, okay? Then he got it published, and then years after he got the Nobel Prize, so, okay, so, you know, referees are tough on you, but. Okay, so we have pharmaceutical firm two, and first we, this becomes a generic manufacturer, and things don't change so much because the, the demand market doesn't know, and we see that we now have the third one getting some of the market, okay, but then we, over time, we now have the demand price functions changing, okay, so they, the consumers are aware there's a generic out of the charge is typically cheaper. So we see what happens. You see a lot more zeros that are. The second firm, Merck, loses the second uh, demand market entirely. Uh, also, Pfizer goes way down in terms of a demand, whereas the generic competitor gains. And this is, you know, big declines, a severe reduction in profits of firms one and two, decline in firm one at 60%. Uh, Pfizer has 60% of the market, now it only has a third of the market. Okay, so you can see what happens, so no one. And in terms of the data, typically when you get patent right loss, okay, protection loss of a branded drug, you have uh, 40 to 80% decrease because of genetic right, which is a lot. So no wonder they keep on playing games and trying to change you know, how the drug is administered to keep their patents, okay? And U.S. sales dropped over time, okay, to 75%, so it was major. But also, because they love the trajectories, you can see how things change over time. So, this is just, you know, one area, okay? Partial product supply chains. We also do a lot of work in disaster relief where you have time targets. People need the food, the water, the medicines within 48 hours, if not 72 hours. So how do you model that? Okay, it's not just a matter of you know minimizing the total cost subject to uncertain demands. You really need some sort of time targets, okay? but you might not be able to meet that because the infrastructure is so you know compromised, if not destroyed. So this is uh, one of the paper that we wrote, and it was published in a book 
And another contributor to this volume was the Nobel Laureate in Economics, Paula Krugman. So we were really honored. Okay. Also, we care a lot about the quality, because there are huge quality issues in a lot of products in pharma and healthcare and so on. So in 2016, we published a book on competing and supply chain quality. And it was actually a finalist for a prize in France for the best supply chain book that year. And there's a different network to colleges and in terms of great service providers, manufacturers, suppliers, and so forth. And we do also a lot of work in identifying who's the most important supplier. And that came from industry. We were approached and like, how do we know who's the most important? So here, I've given you a panoramic view of different kinds of applications. Uh, I think uh, the world needs more operations researchers. We can do a lot of good. The work is very, very satisfying. It's very gratifying okay, to work in different areas. And um, it, it, it is fabulous. Okay. Also, I'd like to, again, congratulate the student chapter. You are our future. Okay, you've done fantastic work here, and I wish you all the best. I hope to see you in Phoenix on the stage getting a Nobel Award. I think you actually deserve the SOMA Award okay, this year. Okay, so thank you very much, and I appreciate you all for coming. <laughs>